There is none beside you. No one like you. Amen. You didn't think she just worshipped up here, did you? <laughs> she is a worshiper, and I love her heart. Love you this morning. Did you have a pretty good week, all in all? Amen. I had a, another memorial service here yesterday, so if you didn't have that, you had a better week than they did. Amen. Amen. How many of you, when you pull in the driveway out here and you see all those flags waving, your heart beats just a little bit more? <laughs> we have flags out there for first responders. We have flags out there for our policemen. We have flags out there for 9-11. We have flags out there for this great country of ours. Amen. And uh, most of you don't know it, and he's going to be embarrassed, but I wanted to thank him for it publicly. Uh, Fred Kressel, who's head over our tech guys back there, he's always hiding in the corner, and taking that ministry on himself. Every once in a while, he'll put them up and He'll come in, he'll say, uh, is it all right to put them up? I say, yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Fred, from the bottom of our hearts. <laughs> he loves this country and every good thing about it, and he's served our country, and it's, it's down in his heart, man. I'm telling you. Would you stand with me, please, in honor of reading of God's Word? I'm going to be reading from Deuteronomy 22.8. It'll be on the screens up here. It says, when you build a new house, how many of you got a new house since you found Jesus? I mean, we didn't give it to you right after you found Jesus. He didn't either, but I tell you, I'm not living in the same place I used to live. Glory to God. I'm in a little better neighborhood, actually. <laughs> when you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet. How many of you know what a parapet is? I don't. I told my wife that the other day, she said, what in the heck is that? That's a railing or a wall around the top of your house. They had a lot of flat roofs in the Middle East. That was a gathering place. It was like the family room. He said, then you shall make a parapet or a railing for your roof that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. I want to talk to you this morning about building a new life. And like Brother Steve said, some of you have already started. Some of you are a long way down the road in building that life. Some of you haven't started yet, but God has a better life for each and every person. He said the devil came to kill and steal and destroy. I talked to some young people here in the last week or two. They said, I just don't understand. Everything goes wrong all the time. I said, you need to give your heart to Jesus. I said, and then a few things will probably still go wrong, but it'll be okay. It's still better. And he'll build, help you build a new life. Would you bow your heads with me, please? And let's ask for the blessing of the Lord upon our ears, our eyes, our heart, our life. Lord God, we just come before you right now and thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this first day of the week that, God, just as your mercies are new every morning, you give us a day in the week, the Lord's Day to start over. It isn't the last day. It isn't the leftover day. It isn't the day for us to bring you the leftovers of our life. It is the first day of the week. And Father, we come to give you our hearts and our attention this morning. We thank you for your word that you sent to heal us, to change us, to give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding. You said if we will hear your word and in an honest and good heart, keep it that God will build a house that's built on a rock, that the winds and the storms and the rain of this life will not be able to bring it down. And so, Father, help us. Help us today. Holy Spirit of God, speak to the very depths of our being. Break the loaves and fishes of your word, Jesus, and multiply it to every person in this room, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody in agreement with that prayer said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now you might feel like you're sitting in the dark. I started experimenting on you last week. You know what? You pay better attention this way. You don't move around as much this way. You don't talk as much this way, so we're going to do it this way. 
least till you get used to it. <laughs> we have seen that God cares about how we treat our neighbor's ox. He cares about that. He cares about your neighbor. We saw that he cares about a bird's nest. I talked to you last week. I said, man, God gives attention to detail. Living for God is an intensely spiritual thing. I've said it over and over down through the years. I said, if we're not careful, this generation is going to be remembered as the generation of Christians that your Christianity was your favorite pastime. The thing you did when everything else that you wanted to do was done and out of the way. And that would be a sad testimony if it is. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. I'm really preaching to the people that aren't here this morning. <laughs> but Christianity can't be something you just tack and add on to some parts of your life. It's all or nothing. Jesus is not a second fiddle God. He said, you've got to love me above all else. He is a righteous God, and because of that, He said, when you do that, I will love you with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. He said that through the prophet Jeremiah. You mean, God, you're going to love me like I love you? You got it. You got it. Now, he says, when you build a new house, make a wall or a railing around your roof so that no one can fall off and get hurt or end up dead. That's attention to detail. That's the God of the Old Testament. That's the God of the New Testament. I hope you see the same God in both. He cares about everyone and everything. And again, we see that. And you know what He's teaching us? He's teaching us that He wants us to do the same thing. God doesn't want you to just care about you and your four and no more. He wants you to care about the whole human race to the best of your ability and as He opens doors and He brings people into the sphere of your world, no matter who they are or what they are, He wants you to reach out to them in love and care about them, even as you care for yourself. He said, love your neighbor even as you love yourself. In fact, Jesus took it even deeper. He said, when you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto Me. I've cautioned some of our leadership every once in a while because, you know, in churches, every time we get ready to do something, the first thing we talk about is how cheap and how little we can do it a lot of the times. And I think, really? Is that how you want to treat Jesus? <laughs> you want to do the least and the cheapest and the smallest and, you know, the most convenient? Is that how you really want to treat Jesus? See, we're supposed to give great attention to every detail of our lives. And I shared with you last week, I said the big things matter to God. The little things matter to God. A lot of people come to Christ and they find salvation and they think it all matters in the big things, but not the little things. And if you look at it that way, you're never going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came in to rearrange your whole heart, your whole life, and everything about you. Your speech should change. Your actions should change. Your dog, when you really get saved, once you're saved even for a week or two, your dog ought to be the first one to know you're saved. Your children ought to know there's a difference in you. Everybody around you ought to see this is not the same person that I once knew. Why? Because everything begins to change. Well, now we turn our attention to building new houses. I like that. You know, God is a God of second chances. He's a God of new beginnings. He is a God that no matter what you've done, where you've come from, what you did today, yesterday, or even what you're going to do tomorrow, if you will fall down on your face before Him in repentance, He said, we can start over. <laughs> The devil lied to me for about the first five years of my Christianity. Every time I even messed up a little bit, he said, Ah, uh ah, -huh, uh -huh. God don't love you. God don't care about you. You just blew it, man. You, you ought to just quit. Tells us all that. Tells us all that. 
In fact, if you quit hearing those voices, he's probably already got you. We all hear those voices all the time. The devil, does want, he wants you to quit. He hates that God gives you mercies new every morning. He hates that God is a God of forgiveness and love and mercy. He hates it because he hates everything that God is. But God loves you so much that there can always be a new beginning and he can give you a new life. <laughs> I was standing beside somebody here yesterday and they got to talking about it. They said, I was born in 1973. I said, oh, man, I said, I'd already ruined one life and started on another one by the end. <laughs> Make you feel old, man. Whew. But you know what? God will help us to build a new house and a new life and a new everything if we'll listen to Him and we'll let Him. And, you know, again, when you look at Scripture, we can read over things like that and think, man, is, that's strange. Because this book is supposed to be about deep, spiritual, eternal truths. Why does God care anything about putting a railing on the top of our house if we're going to build a new house? We might not have even had that in the blueprints. And God says, you need to build a railing. But the problem is, when we go to the Bible, we think ordinary and material things and, you know, like that don't matter, and that is one of the biggest mistakes that we can make in life. We think some things are spiritual, and some things are religious, and that other things are just material and secular and really don't matter. I don't know if you ever thought about this, though, but man invented the word secular. Now, before I got saved, if I'd have heard that word, I'd have thought it had something to do with sex. You know, because I didn't know some of them big words. Secular is a word we use to describe when we're doing things or something we think is outside of the realm of God's kingdom. You know, in other words, some people say, well, you have a spiritual job, Pastor Ken. You're a preacher. You're a pastor. And I only work in a factory as a welder. I, I have a secular job. Can I tell you that's one of the biggest mistakes you'll make in your life as a Christian if you look at life that way? Because we invented that word, nothing is secular to God. There isn't any part of your life that doesn't belong to God or that God doesn't want to be a part of. In fact, he said whether you eat or you drink or you work or you play or whatever you do, he said do it all. Do it all as a spiritual offering to God, everything. Your speech, your thoughts, your walk, your job, everything. Bible even says one place says when you're working work as though you were working for Jesus himself you said I'm not working for Jesus I'm working for the Antichrist it doesn't matter God will take care of you if you work for him like you are working for Jesus why because he wants us to do everything as unto the Lord Many of you that have been a part of this church have heard me say it before. In fact, probably not much anything I haven't said you haven't heard before. I believe you can mow your grass, wash your clothes. <laughs> anything that you do, you can do to the glory of God if you have a single eye toward God. So what about building a wall around our roof so that others are protected from harm? What is so spiritual about that? Well, first of all, I'll say this to you. God said do that, and when you do it, it's not about you. He didn't say build a wall so you won't fall off. You know your roof, <laughs> hopefully. He said build a wall so that your neighbor won't come up there and maybe accidentally go over and hurt himself or fall off. He's teaching us that even in the building of a house, it cannot be selfishly all about us. Rick Warren, in his book about the purpose-driven life, teaching you how to live Christianity, and if you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it. The very first line of the book says this, it is not about you. Let me rephrase it the way Jesus said it. If you will lose your life for my sake, 
you will find it. Let me rephrase another way he said it. He that would be greatest among you shall be servant of all. It's a hard lesson for us to learn, but the reality is self ought to have no place in Christian thinking. If you're living every day just trying to make you happy and you comfortable and meet your needs, you're going to miss God. Our fallen nature, by nature, is selfish and self-centered. And even in the building of this house and putting a railing around it, God's saying, like Rick Warren said to you in that book, it's not about you. It really isn't. You say, oh, but I got needs. My name's Bob. I got needs. God said, did you hear what he said? He said, lose your life for my sake. And you'll find it. God says when you realize that it's not about you and you start living for others, God Himself will take care of you and your needs. Well, let me rephrase another way Jesus said that. He said, seek ye the kingdom of God first and His righteousness, Matthew 6, and all these things will be added unto you. What? Housing, food, clothing, and any other thing that you need. Oh, Pastor Ken, I know God will only give us what we need, but i got a few wants. You know, the Bible also says in another place, when a man's ways please the Lord, he'll give him the desires of his heart. If you'll live for God rightly, after a while you'll think, I'm his favorite. I must be his favorite child. You know why? Because He'll bless you rising up. He'll bless you sitting down. He'll bless you going out. He'll bless you coming in. He'll bless everything that you set your hand to. <laughs> oh, I wish you Jesus. <laughs> I really do. And a relationship with Him. And, but you've got to lose yourself to find that. You really do. Self has no place. It have no place. And at first, that may seem like an impossibility, and by yourself it is, but it is one of the miracles that cannot be done by human will, but can be done by the power of the Holy Spirit in you. His presence, His power, His indwelling Holy Spirit. We have a God that anything He asks us to do, we can do, and if we can't, He said, I will empower you through the Holy Spirit to do it. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 10.24 says. It says, be concerned about others and not just about themselves or ourselves. Well, if I were to say somebody building a new house, you know what? God says you need to build a railing around the top of this house. Somebody might have an objection. They might say, well, why should I go all to the trouble and expense of building a railing for my neighbor who might only be here once in a while, maybe not at all? <laughs> Sounds like a good argument, doesn't it? Why should I spend my good money? Why should I take the time to put this railing up here for a neighbor who maybe will only come once in a while? Well, think about this. You might live somewhere where the average temperature of the year is pretty mild. The 12 months out of the year, the rain is really gentle and the wind's always low. So why build a house with strong walls and a heavy roof and the odd chance that there might be really one really bad stormy day? That's kind of the same reasoning. <laughs> now you're going to build for the worst day of weather that could possibly come if you're smart. I noticed here lately they're starting to question people that are building their houses on the sand at the beach and rebuilding and rebuilding and you and I are having to pay for it. I love New Orleans. I lived there one time. But I don't remember them ever giving us any of the uh, income and the money that they've earned during Mardi Gras. <laughs> you know, they've never said, oh, we made all kind of money in surplus. Uh, State of Maryland, we're going we're gonna to give you some money out of our blessings. You ever heard them say that, Brother Steve? Never. But every time it gets flooded, <laughs> I remember when I was living there, the 
the first really weird thing I saw was is all the graveyards are above ground. They've all got little tombs. You can't bury somebody six foot down. They'll float out to sea. I thought, well, that ain't real smart. And I wasn't that old and I wasn't that smart back then when I said that. I thought, you know, <laughs> sooner or later, this thing's probably going to go under. We need to be smart. What if I were building a ship? Do we only build a ship that'll stay together on very gentle and calm seas, you know, and water isn't moving and the moon's out and we make it of the lightest and cheapest materials we can find? Because, you know, after all, where we're at, where there's hardly ever a rough storm or a rough sea, I'll just, only happens once in a great while. Would you do that? No. So God's teaching us another thing. He's teaching us that as we go through life, we need to be prepared for crisis ahead of time. To expect the unexpected. To be sure of the uncertain. Someone wisely said this. They said, the only constant thing in life is change. We get fooled a lot, don't we? Especially when things get going good and we're rolling along, we just think, man, it's going to be like this for the next 20 years. Wrong. <laughs> not. Brother Steve said, not. <laughs> I can tell you this. Life is constantly changing. I heard a preacher say one time, he's quoting the 23rd Psalm, he says, he causes me to lay down that big green grass and he leaves me beside still waters. He said, when you're there, you better learn to drink deeply because guess what's coming? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> Some of us are, are afraid to be happy because we're waiting for the other foot to drop. When you get those times, soak it in. Squeeze it out. Enjoy everything you can get out of it because yes, surely, things are going to change. Nothing ever stays exactly the same. So that's why we need to the best of our ability to prepare for things before they get there. The one that lives to be so prepared even for his neighbor's sake, how many of you know is going to be found pretty equal to anything that gets thrown their way? The man, though, who is anxious to save himself at the expense of erecting a railing around his house might say, well, there's enough time to build one when we actually see the danger looming. After we build it and we see, you know, what, can somebody actually fall off this thing? We do a lot of that dumb stuff. They put in a red light right out at the end of my street where I come out of my development. I love it because before everybody was fighting for, you know, the right of way and they put it up. Well, we had a windstorm here about a month ago and it turned one of the lights sideways and flipped the yield on green sign the other direction. I've called them twice now. I waited three weeks and I thought they'll get to it and they didn't and I called them. They said, we'll get to it and I wait another week or two. They still haven't got to it. I'm thinking somebody's going to die. <laughs> Somebody's going to die, and then they're going to say, ah, we need to do something about this. When you come out of my development, where they put the light, where I come out, I'm here, and there's another road coming out, and it's kind of offset. The light turns green, and everybody over here thinks they have the right of way. You wouldn't believe the people are fighting to get in front of you. I trick them. I don't even put my turn signal on anymore. They don't know if I'm coming straight across or going right. I'm going right, but I don't give them a turn signal. Because if I do, they'll run right out in front of me. I told them about that too. I said, you need to get somebody out here. Look at this. They're going to kill people. I watched a lot of air disaster documentaries on TV. Thank God we don't still live in the 80s and the 90s. They killed passenger planes full of people to figure out, you and I, that we just might need a little bigger control screen on the front of this thing so these pilots can see what they're doing. Or we might need to make sure that when we take the bolts out of the tail wing that somebody else looks at it afterwards and makes sure they're all in there. I don't want to scare you. It, it's really broke my illusion of pilots. I thought they were a higher class of people. They're Uber drivers. And some of them not real good. 
life, life <laughs> is too valuable. It's too fragile, <laughs> you know, to always wait until we kill somebody to fix something or we hurt somebody or that sort of thing. We can't live life like that. Life, on the other hand, is to be regulated by the fact that an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. You ever heard that? It's, it's, it's better to help somebody not to suffer through something than it is to even help them out of it once they're into it. See, we're not at liberty to experiment with other people's lives to see whether they're going to fall off the roof or not. It's too valuable. Life is too valuable. Did you know the one who prevents a life being lost actually saves a life? Preventative ministries aren't as celebrated and they don't have as much glory in them as those that reach down in the middle of the emergency and the crisis. And, you know, we hear about pilots who do save planes. <laughs> Thank God. Or somebody that's rescued someone else or, you know, we hear about those things. But what about those that live their life in such a way I know I've experienced this. I was a drug addict, an alcoholic, sucking cigarettes out, you know, the gazoo, whatever that is. And, you know, people say, Pastor Kent, thank God. Look what God did in your life. But what about the parents and the young people that have been raised in God's house by God's words who's never touched a cigarette, never touched a drug, never did all of those horrible, terrible things that we've gotten into. We don't talk much about them, but you know what? They're the real heroes. Those are the real miracles. <laughs> in fact, I've lived long enough to be envious of you. I love watching some of our young people, the teenagers and the little kids, and I'm thinking... Man, these parents love God and they love these kids and these kids are never going to have to roll through the garbage pile that I rolled through. Thank God Almighty. What I'm trying to say to you, it's better not to go through the garbage <laughs> to begin with, to have preventative ministry in life, even though others may not see it as such. The reality is, is that one of these days, only God Himself sees some of that stuff and really affixes the right value and purpose in it. God cares that you're taking care of your families. God cares that you are directing them in the right way. God cares that you aren't making all the mistakes that everybody else makes and that you're living for Him and following His Word. He really cares about that. He loves you for that. I was 22 years old when I got saved <laughs> and finally figured out I don't have to make every mistake myself. I can learn from others and from God's Word. You know, to save a boy from ever becoming an alcoholic is better than saving him after he's a drunk. You might ever, not ever get recognized for it. I think of all the wonderful things that God does for us and our families that nobody will ever see or know till we get to heaven because they avoided the danger and the fear and the problems because of the path that we helped to set them on. God himself continually operates in what may be called a preventive direction. In fact, we get really messed up with our interpretation of the Bible sometimes because God is speaking to us about how to fix it before we get into it. And the problem is we're usually into it, and then we're trying to discern what he's really trying to say to us. You say, what do you mean, Pastor Ken? Oh, he that divorces one commits adultery, and the one that divorces and goes and marries another commits adultery. Pastor Ken, I've, I've been through a divorce. You mean I can't ever get married again, and if I do, I'm committing adultery? No. He's talking to you before the fact. He's saying, don't divorce one and go marry another. That'll be adultery. He's telling you ahead of time. And a lot of God's words that way, and that's why we get messed up and we're trying to read it. We read it after we've already made the mistake, after we're already in the sin, and then we're like, God, what do you mean? He's trying to tell you, don't go there to begin with. Don't go there to begin with. See, we might also ask this question. 
But shouldn't men be able to take care of themselves when they're walking on our roof? I mean, shouldn't they have enough sense that if they walk over the edge not to fall off? <laughs> and it might be, even be argued that if we do too much for people, they'll, get, they'll just get into this spirit of carelessness or dependence that might ultimately lead to thoughtlessness in every area of life then we become enablers <laughs> of bad habits. Uh, you've heard me say, I went to Thailand years ago. You don't know how spoiled we are. When I was in Thailand, everywhere I walked, this is what I did. I'd walk into the hut I was staying in, I'd stumble. I'd walk into the bathroom, the airport, and I'd stumble. I'd walk, <laughs> walk on the edge of the sidewalk, and I'd stumble. You know why? Because we have handicap ramps and corners. Our doorways no longer have anything on the bottom of them. They're only on the top. But the rest of the world doesn't have all that. In fact, if you go to the rest of the world, you're going to see that both safety and sanitation aren't a big priority. And the reason I was doing that is that everywhere I went, there were still curbs. Everywhere I went, there were still doorways. I didn't realize how spoiled we are as Americans. Man, we barely have to lift our feet anywhere to do anything. <laughs> and we just take it for granted because it's been there forever. You know, sometimes we can overdo it with people. It is possible, and it's a hard line to discern sometimes about enabling people. You can do too much for people. You can help people when they're doing bad things and you can help them to the point that you enable them to do it and you can help destroy them. But it's, it's a fine line between helping them and destroying them and especially as Christians because as Christians we are always supposed to do all we can even for the weakest among us. It's a hard line sometimes. But God says, him that is weak, receive in the faith. Don't destroy your brother <laughs> with meat for whom Christ died. We're always supposed to be thinking about the welfare and the care of other people. The Bible said in one place, if eating flesh or drinking wine offends my brother, I will eat or drink no more wine or meat while the world stands. How many of you are ready to become vegetarians if somebody don't like what you're eating and drinking? Really? Thank you, Cindy. God bless you, girl. You're on your way to heaven. <laughs> now, I'm not talking about snowflake, I'm offended at everything, wah, wah, wah. I'm talking about somebody is really hurt, stumbled, or offended by what you're doing. Are you ready to give it up? In fact, you can find out if something's an idol in your life if somebody really seriously gets to that place. Right before I got saved, I had a Christian witnessing to me at work. And one of the first things he said to me was, he said, you know that pot you're smoking out there at lunchtime and them drugs you're dropping? You know, God is not into that. Now, at the time, I didn't drink coffee, and this guy was a coffee fiend. And so when he started jumping on me about my drug, he didn't really jump on me. He was trying to tell me what God's Word said about it. I looked him square in the eye and I said, you drink coffee like a drug addict. Because I was trying to run him off. He looked me dead in the eye. He said, if that's the only thing that's keeping you from coming to church and giving your life to Christ, he said, I promise you right now, I'll never drink another drop of it as long as I live. You know what I said to that? Nothing. <laughs> what can you say to that? <laughs> he didn't try to explain to me, you know, how it was better than what I was doing and how it was okay and all Christians drink coffee, blah, blah, blah. He said, I won't do that anymore. You, you mean really, Pastor Ken? God wants me to live and care about what others think about the things I do? Yeah. Duh. Duh! God let me work in a factory for the first eight years I was a Christian. How many of you know unsaved people can usually figure things out that are sinful before you can? They'll come up and they say, oh, you go to church and look what you just did. I used to run back in the corner and go, God, 
Jesus, you love me, and they're persecuting me, they're beating on me. And you know what God said? He said, They're right. I said, Really? Yeah. You need to change that. See, I think the devil inspires them for a while, but I figured that out and I said, Well, I'll just let the devil help me get straightened up and cleaned up and stuff I don't see. I was really prideful about not stealing before I got saved. But I had another little hang up. I knew people that stole. And out of those people, I was one of the few that had a little bit of money once in a while. And they'd show up at my door and they'd say, look at this nice stereo I got. How much is that? Ten bucks. I had done that for about four or five years before I got saved. <laughs> and I was saved about a week and a half. And I'm sitting in my apartment one night and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, everything I own in here is hot. I'm listening to WCRH on a hot stereo. I went to my pastor. I said, Pastor, I got a problem. He said, what? I said, I got all kind of stolen stuff in my apartment. He said, did you steal? It hurt my feelings because I was above stealing. I just wasn't above buying hot stuff. It did. It hurt my feelings. I didn't tell him. I said, no, I didn't steal it, but I've been buying it for a long time. I said, what do I need to do with it? He said, you need to give it back to the people you got it from. You ever try to call a thief up and say, I'm going to give you your stuff back? <laughs> they come over and they said, you ain't turning us into the cops, are you? We heard you got religion, you're going to church. I said, no, I ain't turning you into cops. Well, we ain't paying for it. I said, just take it. <laughs> just get it out of here. And they did, and my apartment was almost completely empty. <laughs> the bed was rented, part of the apartment, thank God. A couple days later, two of my unsaved buddies come in, and they said, where in the world is all your stuff? And I told them what I just told you. They said, you know, we were sitting down at the bar the other night talking about how you're all this Jesus person now going to church with all this stolen stuff in your apartment. They said, man, something must have really happened to you. <laughs> I said, yeah, I got Jesus in my heart and in my life. God wants us to care about what we look like to everybody. You know, the Bible said, shun even the very appearance of evil. And if somebody's putting you down, don't just automatically assume you're being persecuted. Look at what they're talking about first and say, maybe I need to make a change. Now, you've got to use wisdom, but see, the spirit of the Bible is, if my brother's offended by me eating meat or drinking wine, I won't touch it as long as the world stands. I don't want to destroy somebody and be a stumbling block to somebody. That's what he's saying. See, that's caring about other people. Well, bless God, I don't care what anybody thinks. I only care what God thinks. You don't get it. <laughs> if you're saying that stupid stuff, oh, don't judge me, only God can judge me. Do you know we're supposed to be light and salt and shine into the world? How can you make a dumb statement like that? Well, they ain't, they ain't allowed to look at me and judge me. Oh, yes, they are. You're supposed to be showing them the path and the light and the way to God through your life. Because see, here's another thought. You might be able to walk on your roof without danger, but what about everybody else around you? Now, I'm going to say something, and I don't want you writing me letters and emails. I've already talked this through with God and the world, so... Nothing you say is going to change it. People used to come up to me years ago and they said, God told me to tell you. I said, he did. I said, why do you think God told you and not me? Because you won't listen to God. And I said, and you think I'm going to listen to you? <laughs> now, trust me, if God wants to get your attention, he will get your attention. I don't care who you are. Ask old Nebuchadnezzar. He'll, he'll tell you, God can humble the haughtiest of men, he said. But here's the thing. I used to drink and be a drunkard. I do not drink. I don't drink wine. I don't go to the wine parties. I don't go to the wine fest. I don't drink wine with my Olive Garden spaghetti. I don't do any of that. 
You say, well, you know, God didn't say we couldn't have a beer with the ball game or a glass of wine with our meal. No, he didn't say that. He really didn't. But you know what? If I do that out in public, in front of the entire tri-state area, most of them knew what I used to be. You know what they're going to say? I knew it was just a matter of time. He ain't any different than any of the rest of them. See, sometimes you just don't do things because it's better for other people. It isn't just about you. Don't live your Christianity just on the level of you. Live for God in such a way that others can see Christ through your life clearly, loudly, proudly, shining. Be different. I might as well hit it while I'm here. You cussing around the people you work with, you cuss around your family. You say, oh, I'm trying, I'm struggling, I'll get over it. And they'll go, oh, yeah, okay. You know what they're really thinking? There ain't nothing to that Christianity. It can't even change their language. Yeah. They're no different. They're no different. Why? God, God's about details. He's about details. I'm probably a little too detailed. I'm not going to get done. So here's the thing. We're always to be thinking about others. Love your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says, listen to this, live in such a way that those that are lost, it uses the word of the contrary part, that are not Christians, have no evil thing to say about you. My seven-day Adventist senior citizen neighbor and his wife moved out of our neighborhood. Glory to God, I can cut my grass on Saturdays now. You know what a struggle it was sometimes with my schedule and the weather and everything else not to cut my grass on Saturday. You say, well, what's wrong with cutting grass on Saturday? He's a seven-day Adventist. That was the Lord's day to him. You say, well, you're not seven-day Adventist. No, I'm not. But I wanted to show him that it's a good thing to honor one day in seven for the Lord. So I didn't cut my grass on Saturday. I did about two weeks ago. <laughs> Man, I was shouting all the way. I was like, glory to God, I got a little extra time to cut the grass now. And you say, well, he cut his grass on my Sunday. I know, but I wanted to show him Jesus in a very small way. Besides that, it got his wife to quit coming over and trying to get my wife into her women's Bible study every Tuesday. You know why? Because after a while he recognized, he thought, and he's not Seventh-day Adventist, but apparently he knows Jesus, and that's what I wanted him to know. <laughs> so what does all this have to do with building a new life? If we're to build a house so as not to endanger people who visit us, what kind of life house do you think we're supposed to be building so that the life we're building won't bring destruction to other people? It won't hurt other people. I mean, it goes bigger. You see what I'm saying? God said, I care about the railing. And if I care that much about a railing so that your neighbor don't get hurt, I care about how you live your life so your neighbor don't get hurt. I went to church every Sunday before they paid me to be good. You say, why? Because it's either the Lord's day or my day, it ain't both. But I also wanted other people to see that God matters to me more than anything else. If you would go in my neighborhood today and ask any of my neighbors, where is Ken Harris right now? They know. <laughs> they know her. They got a pretty good idea. I'm just telling you, we need to live a life of influence that influences others. Say, so, oh, I don't have to come to church every Sunday. I'm a good Christian. Yeah, you might, but your kids might not make it that way. I read an article on Facebook a while back about a mom and dad was upset. They went to church once a quarter. And the reason they didn't go the other times, they were taking the kids to the ball games and the soccer games and all the other things. But what they were upset about, now that their kids were grown, they would not keep up the tradition of going to church at least once a quarter. Stupid ain't cheap. <laughs> that 
That's all there is to it. Live your life so that if others never open the Bible or read a word of it, they can follow in your steps and find their way to God. Why? Because they follow the example of your life. That's what he's telling us. We can build a house the way God wants wants us to do it (laughs) and lead others to Christ. Or we can actually build a a material house that will be perfect and have every convenience and every bit of safety and still have our lives be a total wreck. You know how it is sometimes. We ride by them big homes that's three times the size of ours and they got three cars and ten kids in the yard. We think, they're selling drugs. They got to work for the mafia. They couldn't have all that stuff they're doing now. No. But sometimes their lives are a wreck. See, we need to remember children are looking at us. Strangers are taking account of our ways. And sometimes what we may call Christian liberty, in fact, may drag someone else to hell. Are we supposed to abstain from amusements and delights and things we could enjoy without personal injury, lest a weaker man be tempted by it and injure him? (laughs) Absolutely! That's what Christianity teaches, selflessness and care about others. That's the very essence of what real Christian denial is. I'm going to live in such a way that I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you to Christ. We might even use the excuse, well, I'm nobody. I'm so little known, so little account that my example doesn't do anybody any harm. That might sound like humility at first. But you know, Jesus, if you stand before him and say, well, my life was so small and so unnoticeable, it didn't count. He's going to say, what the heck did you do with with stuff I gave you? (laughs) Let him change you so that your life did make a difference in other people's lives. You and I don't have the right to live such small lives that we don't influence anybody else. In fact, it's impossible. The Bible said no man lives unto himself. No man dies unto himself. Whether we live, we live for the Lord. Whether we die, we die for the Lord. We all have influence. I don't care who you think you are. But you're not allowed to have so small example in life that nobody notices you. You're you're a bad steward of life and of all that God's given you, if that's the case. I'm going to ask the worship team to come to the platform. See, this whole area of thought raises a question then of this. Will God give us directions for the building of an earthly house and forget to give us directions for the building of our lives? If he's so careful about that railing that others might not get hurt, what about how we live? Steve didn't only look at the title of my message. I thought he got in my notes, but you couldn't. You don't have no way to do it. He said, with getting, God said, with all you're getting, get wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore, with all you're getting, get understanding. I love every word in this book. But if somebody were to say to me, Pastor Kim, what is your favorite book in this book of 66 books and chapters, books, I guess, if you will, I'd have to say it's the book of Proverbs. And the reason I say that, Proverbs are practical sayings, wise sayings, fear of God sayings about how to live life in every area of your life. You didn't read any other book in the Bible and you just read Proverbs and put it into practice, you'd build one awesome life. You will be smart and wise beyond your years and beyond your age. You will have an understanding greater than some kings and queens and presidents and congressmen and preachers and teachers if you just follow it. People will look at you in amazement when in situations you tell them this is what God's Word says. Why? Because it's full of wisdom. It's full of things to build your life house with. Just read it and apply it. And then listen to, to everything else that Jesus says. Listen to what He says about hearing the Word, all of it, and putting it into practice. He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them He's like a man who built his house on a rock. 
and the rains came and the winds blew, but the house stood through it all. You say, I, I, I need to get things turned around, man. My life is a mess. The owner's manual. <laughs> the creator gave you a book. Some of you ask, I said, man, kids don't come with a manual. Yes, they do. All of them. The little kids, the big kids, the young kids, the old kids, they all come with a manual. Well, I don't read manuals. I know. We've seen some of the stuff you've done. But you need to read this one. <laughs> you need to read this manual and do it. Do what it says. Why? Because then when life hits you in the face, you'll still be able to stand. And others will see that you've got an anchor that holds no matter what is thrown at you. Yes. I'm almost done. Psalm 127, verse 1. This is for those of you that after hearing all this today said, well, I hear you, Pastor Ken, but just not yet. Well, listen. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. People have said to me for years, they said, what changed you? What turned you around? Why did you give your heart to God? The first thought I had was, is I found out I was going to hell and I didn't want to go there. My mama didn't raise no dummies in that area. Oh, well, maybe a couple, but we're, good. we're working on them. But the second thing is, in realizing that, I realized I was not at peace. I was not right or in union with the God of the universe. How can you think that life or relationships or anything else are going to go okay if you're in rebellion to the God of the universe? You said, everything goes wrong, I know. He's trying to put stop signs in front of you to get your attention and get you to wake up before you end up in hell. So many of you have tried to build your life your way. The Bible said, there's a way that seems right to every man, but it says, this in Proverbs, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, Pastor Ken, I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right. If you're not doing it God's way, you're not anywhere close to all right. <laughs> You may feel like it for a few moments here and there, but trust me, the end is not going to be pretty. But some of you are hearing the voice of God today, and you're saying, you know what? I've wrestled long enough. I've been a wreck long enough. I've done it my way long enough. God, I need, I need to do it your way. I'm tired of fighting it. I'm tired of wrestling. I'm tired of kicking against the wall. I need to do it your way, God. And I promise you, he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life in this life and in the life to come. Would you bow your heads with me, please, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, you said if your son would be lifted up, that you would draw all men, women, boys, and girls to him. And as he was lifted up from this earth on that cross, placed between heaven and earth to be the sacrifice for our sins, to be a propitiation and a payment for all the mistakes that we make so that we can start over again. Lord, I lift him up again here this morning before this group of people. And may they see him as the Savior, not only of the world, but of each and every one of their lives, Father. God, may you draw their hearts deeper into you, stronger into you. May we quit fighting and resisting the Holy Spirit and leaving heel marks every step of our journey. May we surrender wholly and completely. And not just in our minds, not just in our prayers, but God, in our walk before you. And Lord, as you have promised to meet us there, when our hearts are humbled and broken and brought before you, you have promised to come in and sup with us and we with you and to empower us into changes from the inside out. Father, let every person 
taste of you. Touch your life here today. Even as we worship before you now. And God, may we surrender all to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Help us to get the victory over everything in our lives. And I ask it in Jesus' name.